Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks to coming to this afternoon's performance of Percy by Shelley's The Mask of Anarchy, a stirring public celebration of nonviolent resistance by the 19th century English romantic poet Percy by Shelley. If you've not already done so, please do take a moment now to silence your cell phones as this evening's performance is being filmed. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a couple more poetry programs this week. On behalf of the San Francisco Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rama Tushaloni, who are the indigenous inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Now about programs. This Thursday, August 8th, in this very room, uh, San Francisco Poet Laureate Emerita Kim Shuck will be uh, inviting poets Jennifer Barone, Ingrid Kerr, Cassandra Dellett, Christine No, Kaleki Obozo, and Jen Cheng to read at SFPL's monthly Poem Jam poetry reading. Later this month, on Sunday, August 25th, also in this room, Heather Buchanan hosts a reading and book signing with writers from Black Fire, this time, volume two, a powerful new anthology of poetry, fiction, essays, and dramas that explores the history and legacy of the black arts movement. If you wanna learn more about these programs, you can pick up a flyer or a newsletter from the table, or you can consult our online events calendar at sfpl.org. Feel free also to help yourself to uh, coffee and cookies on that table. As I said, please do silence your cell phones. And after today's performance, which is a little less than a half hour, there will be a Q&A. We're hoping that you will stay for the Q&A and discussion with the performer. So now I'd like to introduce today's performer. Angelina Yongueras is an actress, playwright, and stage director. She was the lead actress in Metamorphosis by La Fura del Spouse in its two-year international tour. She also has performed her own one-woman show, Fulan is Everyone, at festivals and in important theaters throughout the United States, Europe, and Latin America. As a film and TV actress, she has worked with directors Pedro Almodovar and Rashid Bukhareb and other notables. As playwright, Young Guerras has won awards in Barcelona, New York, and New York for her plays El Cobert and Lo Main in Tequila. As theater director, Young Guerras has directed Benedetti's Pedro and the Captain, Shakespeare's Richard II, Friedrich Dürrenmatt's The Physicist, and Rainer Werner Fassbinder's The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. Young Garris has performed The Mask of Anarchy in Chicago, Barcelona, and Ahmedabad, India. Today, the San Francisco Public Library is honored to host a performance of The Mask of Anarchy in San Francisco. Please give a warm welcome to Angelina Young Garris. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea. And with great power, it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met murder on the way, 
he had a mask like Castle Ray. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well, they might be in admirable plight, for one by one and two by two, he tossed them. Human hearts to chew, which from his white cloak he drew. Next came fraud, and he has on, like Lord Eldon, an ermine gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. And the little children who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains not told by them. Clothed with the Bible, as with light, and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth, next hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. And many more distractions played in this ghastly masquerade. All these guys, even to the eyes, as bishops, lawyers, peers, or spies. Last came Anarchy. He rode on a white horse, splashed with blood. He was pale, even to the lips, like death in the apocalypse. And he wore a kingly crown, and in his grasp a scepter shone. On his brow this mark I saw. I am God and King and Law. With a pace stately and fast over English land he passed trampling to a mire of blood, the adoring multitude. And with a mighty troop around, with their trampling shook the ground, waving each a bloody sword for the service of their Lord. And with glorious triumph, they rode through England, proud and gay, drunk, as with intoxication of the wine of desolation. Over fields and towns, from sea to sea, past the page, and swift and free, tearing up and trampling down, till they came to London town. And each dweller, panic-stricken, felt his heart with terror sicken, hearing the tempestuous cry, of the triumph of anarchy. For from pomp to meet him came, clothed in arms like blood and flame, the hired murderers who did sing, Thou art God and law and king. We have waited, weak and lone, for thy coming, mighty one. Our purses are empty, our swords are cold. Give us glory and blah and gold. Lawyers and priests, a motley crowd, to the earth their pale brows bowed. Like a bad prayer, not over loud whispering, Thou art law and God. Then all cried with one accord, Thou art king and God and Lord, Anarchy, to thee we bow. Be thy name made holy now. Anarchy, the skeleton bowed and green to everyone, <laughs> as well as if his education had cost 10 million to the nation. For he knew the palaces of our kings were rightly his. His the scepter, crown, and globe, and the gold inwoven robe. 
So he sent his slaves before to seize upon the bank and tower and was proceeding with intent to meet his pensioned parliament when one fled past a maniac maid and her name was Hope, she said, but she looked more like despair and she cried out in the air. My father, time is weak and gray with waiting for a better day. See how idiot-like he stands, fumbling with his palsied hands. He has had child after child, and the dust of death is piled over everyone but me. Misery, oh, misery. And she laid down in the street right before the horse's feet, expecting with a patient eye murder, fraud, and honor guy. When between her and her foes, a mist, a light, an image rose, small at first and weak and frail, like the vapor of a veil, till as clouds grow on the blast, like tower crown giants striding fast, and glare with lightning as they fly, and speak in thunder to the sky. It grew, a shape arrayed in mail, brighter than the viper's scale and a born on wings whose grain was as the light of sunny rain. On its helm, seen far away, a planet like the morning's lay, and those plumes its light rains through like a shower of crimson dew. With step as soft as wind, it passed over the heads of men, so fast that they knew the presence there and looked. But all was empty air. As flowers beneath May's footstep waken, as stars from night's loose hair are shaken, as waves arise when loud winds call, thoughts sprung where'er that step did fall. And the prostrate multitude looked, an uncle deep in blood, hope that maiden most serene was walking with a quiet me. And Anarchai, the ghastly birth, lay dead, earth upon the earth, the horse of death, timeless as wind fled, and with his hoofs did grind to dust the murderer's throng behind. A rushing light of clouds and splendor, a sense awakening, and yet tender was heard and felt, and at its close, these words of joy and fear arose as if their own indignant earth, which gave the sons of England birth, had felt their blood upon her brow and shuddering with a mother's throw, had turned every drop of blood by which her face had been bedewed to an accent unwithstood, as if her heart cried out aloud. Men of England, heirs of glory, heroes of unwritten story, nurslings of one mighty mother, hopes of her and one another. Rise, like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number, 
Shake your chains to earth like dew which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many. They are few. What is freedom? Ye can tell that which slavery is too well, for its very name has grown to an echo of your own. Tis to work and have such pay as just keeps life from day to day in your limbs like in a cell for the tyrants used to dwell, so that ye for them are made loom and plough and sword and spade, with or without your own will bent to their defence and nourishment. It is to see your children weak, with their mother's spine and peak when the winter winds are bleak. They are dying whilst I speak. It is to hunger for such diet as the rich man in his riot cast to the fat dogs that lie surfeiting beneath his eye. It is to let the ghost of a thousandfold more than ever its substance could in the tyrannies of old. Paper coin, that forgery of the title deeds which ye hold to something of the worth of the inheritance of earth. It is to be a slave in soul and to hold no strong control over your own will, but be all that others make of ye. And at length, when ye complain with a murmur weak and vain, tis to see the tyrant screw right over your wives and you. Blood is on the grass like you. Then it is to feel revenge fiercely thirsting to exchange blood for blood and wrong for wrong. Do not thus, as ye are strong. Birds find rest in narrow nest when weary of their winged quest. Beasts find fair in woody lair when storm and snow are in the air. Horses, oxen find a home when from daily toil they come. Household dogs, when the wind roars, find a home within warm doors. All things have a home but one. Thou, O oh Englishman, hast none. This is slavery. Savage men or wild beasts within a den would endure not as ye do but such ills they never knew. What art thou, freedom? Ah, could slaves answer from their living graves this demand? Tyrants would flee like a dream's imagery. Thou art not, as impostors say, a shadow soon to pass away, a superstition or a name echoing from the cave of fame. For the laborer, thou art bread. And a comely table spread from his daily labor come in a neat and happy home. Thou art clothes and fire and food for the trampled multitude. No, in countries that are free, such starvation cannot be, as in England now we see. To the rich, thou art a check. When his foot is on the neck of his victim, thou dost make that he treads upon a snake. Thou art justice. Ne'er for gold may thy righteous laws be sold as laws are in England. Thou shiltst alike both high and low. Thou art wisdom. Free men never think that God will damn forever those who think those things untrue, of which priests make such ado. 
Thou art peace. Ne'er by thee would blood and treasure wasted be as the tyrants wasted them when all leak to quench thy flaming gall. What if English toil and blood was poured forth even as a flood? It availed, O liberty, to dim but not extinguish thee. Thou art love, the rich have Kiss thy feet, and like him following Christ, give their substance to the free, and through the rough world follow thee. Or turn their wealth to arms, and make war for thy beloved sake, on wealth and fraud and war, whence they drew the power which is their prey. Science, poetry, and thought are thy lamps. They make the lot of the dwellers in a cot so serene, they curse it not. Spirit, patience, gentleness, all that can adorn and bless art thou. Let deeds, not words, express thine exceeding loveliness. Let a great assembly be of the fearless and the free on some spot of English ground where the plains stretch wide around. Let the blue sky overhead, the green earth on which ye tread, all that must eternal be, witness the solemnity. From the corners at their most of the bounds of English coast, from every hut, village, and town, where those who live and suffer moan for others' misery or their own, from the workhouse, and the prison, where pale as corpses newly risen, women, children, young and old, groan for pain and weep for cold from the daily hunts, where those who groan and wail as must make their brethren pale. Ye who suffer woes untold, or to feel or to behold, your lost country, bought and sold for a price of blood and gold, let a vast assembly be, and with great solemnity declare in measured words that ye are, as God has made ye, free. Be your strong and simple words, keen to wound the sharpened swords, and why the starges let them be, with their shade to cover ye. Let the tyrants pour around with a quick and startling sound like the loosening of a sea, troops of armed emblazonry. Let the charged artillery drive till the dead air seems alive with the clash of clanging wheels and the tramp of horses' heels. Let the horsemen scimitars wheel and flash like fearless stars, thirsting to eclipse their burning in a sea of death and mourning. Let the fixed bayonet gleam with sharp desire to wet its bright point in English blood, looking keen as one for food. Stand ye calm and resolute, like a forest close and mute, with folded arms and looks, which are weapons of unvanquished war. And let panic, who outspeeds the career of armed steeds, pass a disregarded shade through your phalanx undismayed. Let the loss of your own land, good or ill, between ye stand, hand to hand, and foot to foot, arbiters of the dispute. The old laws of England, they whose reverent heads with age are gray, children of a wiser day, and whose solemn voice must be thine own echo, liberty, on those who first should violate such sacred heralds in their state, rest the blood that must ensue and it will not rest on you. And if then the tyrants 
dare let them ride among them. Slash and stab and maim and hew what they like. That let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes and little fear and less surprise, look upon them as they slay till their rage has died away. Then they will return with shame to the place from which they came, and the blood that shed will speak in hot blushes on their cheek. Every woman on the land will point at them as they stand. They will hardly dare to greet their acquaintance on the street. And the bold, true warriors who have hot danger in wars will turn to those who would be free, ashamed of such base company. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become like oppression's thunder doom, ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, again, again. Rise, like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew which in sleep hath fallen on you. Are many they are few. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. So you know, we can we can have a round table if you want now. So this piece and why now? You have on my phone. Oh. <laughs> This is my microphone, okay. I, I, it's not now. It, uh, I created this show when I, was in, when I lived in San Francisco and there was the Occupy movement. Uh, uh, John hasn't said it, but I mean, I, I played this in the financial di district during Occupy San Francisco in front of all the homeless. And I also played it in a gallery here owned by poet Dottie Payne uh, from the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. I created it, why? The, that was, you know, why now? So it's not really now. Now I'm grateful to John that I can do here a, a, a show that was born in San Francisco. And why? Why? Because I love the poem. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful poem. And I usually always turn into theater a text that I love. You know, some people work from maybe body gestures or other things. I usually use that as a text person, what inspires me the text, and then, you know, from that text I work. But it's not that I'm a kind of a specialist in Shelley or any sort of a thing, but I did love this a lot. Uh, I love the piece uh, which you did. It was beautiful. I wanted to, um, like, how did you resonate with the slavery of the Englishman? Like, how did you uh, resonate with it? And then you wanted to do this. I would like to know the story. Well, I'm uh, the daughter of some resistance to the Francoist dictatorship. I'm a Catalan. 
uh, I was raised with parents that always told me, you know, to feel very proud of the working class and to be a member of the working class because they said, well, you know, there's basically two classes, one that works and one that steals. So you belong to the one that works. <laughs> yeah, I know that this is simplifying it a lot, but I mean, you know, I, I felt like, uh, and I've always resonated, of course, with things having to do with social justice. Also, also my father specifically taught me that uh, I was an internationalist ever since I was born because said, you know, injustice in any, I mean, that could be from the Che Guevara, but actually my father said it also. And he said uh, an injustice anywhere in the world is an injustice to all. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't think that my my territory was just my small country, which was very small and occupied by Spain, etc. But you know, but the whole world. <laughs> Catalonia. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, sure. How did you remember all the um, things to say in the steps? Well, actually, I made a mistake today for which I am furious with myself <laughs> because I got one or two. It's a pity, but. How do I? Well, there's no, you know, there's no simple word. You simply have to repeat it every day, every day, every day. So I, I've been repeating this ever since the 24th of June when I arrived in Chicago. I started to relearn it. Fortunately, you know, when you have already learned it, the heaviest time is the first. Once you've done it, I mean, now I didn't do it since 2018. I did it in Bucharest as well, uh, in Romania. That was the last time. And that was 2018, so it's six years. So of course, you know, I had forgotten. I mean, I remember lines and so on, but then. But once you start, you go at it, and it comes quickly, because it's already in some forgotten drawer in your brain, you know? But yeah, you have to repeat. That's the repetitive part, like if you are training you know, to, to, for, for a physical exercise, you have to repeat it every day. This is exactly the same. Angelina, hi. Uh, I know you're from Barcelona and Catalonia, and um, clearly there's so many parallels with Ireland, um, a victim of settler colonialism. Um, yes. Yeah, the first colony of the first capitalist country in the world, Karl Marx said. And it, seems like Catalonia has experienced kind of this internal um, colonization and oppression, but that language is so very important. Um, I believe you got a, you went back to university, got a degree in the Catalan language, and as we know, there's a resurgence, and the Irish has always fought to retain their language, and now there's the first feature film ever in the world yes. in the Irish language. Yes, I read about this uh, Irish film in Irish language. I'm so glad. Every time I can see a film in a minority, I, and I don't call them minority, I call them minoritized. In a minoritized language, and I've seen many films, well, not many because there aren't many, but I've seen a Guatemalan film spoke in Nahuatl. You know, I've seen Mexican films. I seen a Basque film uh, maybe about uh, six months ago about the mythical times, etc. And well, you know, I mean, there is a resurgence, but our language is more threatened than ever because, uh, you know, there is um, um, a total trying, I mean, I'm not going to go into, you know, the, the things of the Catalan politics because it would be too complicated without knowing anything, but the, the, the fight against the language hasn't started. The fact that, you know, we speak Catalan in Catalonia, we speak it in Valencia, and we speak it in, in the islands, in the Balearic Islands, and they say, no, that's not the same language. I mean, it's like saying that Mexican, Argentinian, and uh, Spanish are not the same language. Well, of course, you know. I mean, everyone speaks, but it all comes from Spanish. So, I mean, it's exactly the same. And that's one of the methods that are used to kill a language, uh, you know, to say that that language 
in fact, does not exist in many places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is ongoing. So I don't know if there is a resurgence. I feel that it's very threatened. But yes, I, I've done what you say. I've studied four years of Catalan language and literature, and I'm feeling very happy about having done it. First of all, because it was during the COVID time, and it was actually something fantastic to to be doing at that time. And uh, it has given me a lot of strength in my own roots and to separate very clearly my own culture from Spanish culture because, I mean, it has nothing to do with it, you know? And, and I mean, Spanish culture is interesting, but it's not my culture. May I ask you a question, Angelina, about, uh, you spoke a little bit about the Catalan language. Or have you written or are you writing any plays in the Catalan language? Yeah. I am, I am, and I feel very happy to say it, because I hadn't done it for many years, but this last year and a half, together with the same woman who helped me write my um, Fulani's Everyone, which I don't know if people here have seen it, but I also did it in San Francisco, um, uh, uh, we have created a play called The Speech, because it's about a speech that a Catalan writer, Victor, Victor Catala, she had um, the name of a man, like many writers at that time did, because if you gave a woman's name, everyone said, well, it's not worth reading, right, if it's been written by a woman. So many women use that, because otherwise they couldn't even access to contests and things like that, you know? So, um, I, yes, I've written that, and I'm using these holidays, strange holidays, because I'm an American citizen, and uh, I became an American citizen for living here many years. And um, so I came to renew my passport, because if you're not born in the country, you cannot go to the embassy and do it. You have to come to the country. So, you know, I haven't come in all these years, because I... I have very little money. And uh, so, you know, I've sometimes gone to places for the food. And I think it's magnificent to go for the food. You know, uh, I have nothing uh, uh, against it. And you know, I'm not saying that other people do, but I have done it sometimes. And, you know, to do something for the food is one of the most uh, reasonable things that you can do in, in this life. Uh, many people work eight hours a day for the food. So, um, ah, sorry, I lost my thread, but what I, yes, I've written this play, the speech, and uh, I love it, and I'm now translating it, and I'm hoping to bring to Barcelona, bring back to Barcelona with me in September, uh, a corrected translation, because I want the translation to be as good as I can, because she's a lovely writer, and if I don't do a very good translation, I will cheapen her, and I don't want to. I'm not going to do this play in English. Even if I do it in, in the States, if I'm lucky enough, I will do it in Catalan, but I will put subtitles, because I want people, and I'm one of the advocates for people, hearing minoritized languages on stage. Hello, Angelina. Hello. Um, the poem... Uh, and thank you. That was was a magnificent to read uh, the reading. Thank you very much. My question is: the poem talks about revolution. So many revolutions have failed. <laughs> do you believe in uh, revolutions yes, and that I possibility? Do. And how how do you see that in light of all the failed dreams and so on that I think uh, we I, deal uh, with? Okay, sorry <laughs> for the past. I don't think any revolution has failed. I think all of them have succeeded and have changed amazing things. I mean, where would we be without the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Commune, which was a revolution, too small to, you know, the, the Cuban Revolution, um, the revolution nowadays in Venezuela. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think that all these things are very important, and revolution does not mean, 
does not mean blood. It usually has meant blood, and it has meant, I mean, one of the reasons, and I totally understand why you say it has failed, because it's true that most revolutions start very liberally, very liberally and in the end, the old patriarch, uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna even, you know, the old patriarch strong man comes and we have the dictator again, well, that's because we haven't got rid of patriarchy yet, you know, and this is a very well-known figure which starts coming back, and it's, it, it, it comes back. But I do think, yes, that, that they are very, very important, and, uh, and I'm, in this sense, I'm actually less nonviolent than Shelley, because I'm uh, somebody who believes what Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. So that's my own personal point of view. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, that the beast nowadays, and we all know, I think, who the beast is, uh, wants us to be making war with each other. And, you know, because the more it, it, it feeds on our suffering, it feeds on our rage, it feeds on all this. So I think, you know, it would be wonderful to have a law of revolution that went far beyond what the hippies and the 60s went, you know? But really, truly, a law of revolution where we are here standing for one another, helping one another, ignoring the system. You know, if we can just turn off the TVs, turn off our telephones except for half an hour a day, the most important thing, and we dedicate ourselves to help our neighbors and ourselves, well, that would be a revolution. <laughs> Any other questions? So, um, sorry, my second question. No, no. Um, you have lived here in US, and now you went back to Catalan. So how is that, how does that feel now to be living there now and experiencing again where you were born? I went back home and uh, all my life I had felt that home was not a very nice place to be because I come from a very dysfunctional family like I think 97% of us come. Although they were very nice people, but, you know, and they certainly tried their best. But I always felt that because of many things, I, it didn't feel like my home sometimes. So, you know, I loved it and hated it. And I loved it, but at a certain time I had to get out of it, you know. And, of course, I love traveling, and this has given me a lot. And I will keep traveling, but I want to live in Barcelona for the rest of my life. So that will be my base. And, you know, I'll visit like I'm visiting now. I actually have plans for the next three years. Next year, I'm going to India because I still have a 10-year visa, which will end at the end of uh, next year. So I really want to go to... It's a place that I was there only for two and a half months, and I... I found it so amazing that I want to go back. And, you know, they say that there are two magic countries in the world. One is India and the other is Mexico. And I've been in both. I love them both. I'm so much in love with India and Mexico. So, yeah. Well, if, if there's no further questions, um Oh, okay. If there's no further questions, let me tell you something, because although this is not the performance, uh, and, and I will be very brief, but this is all still very formal. If you want to continue this a little bit, I would like to go right here in front of the library, where on the side where there is the shop, um, right in front there is a place, a Turkish place called Mediterranean Cuisine, you're okay. And you can, okay. And you can have from just a soup and a, a pita bread or two baklavas 
or wraps or a whole dinner. So everyone can eat according to their thing. And I'd love to continue much more informally if you have time and you can come to this place. So I, I just say this to, to finish unless somebody wants to ask something else. I, I, I've eaten there. I can that I can guarantee the food is delicious. So the name of the restaurant is Euro King, and it's across the street from the main entrance of the library on Grove Street, opposite the main entrance. Well, thank you, Angelina, for a marvelous performance. Thank you. Thank you, audience, for coming, and thank you to our AV crew.